thank you so much. <laughs> there we go. Okay, I'm going to be quiet now. Huh. Wait a minute, please. But um, it's uh, wait a minute. I have to. Um, well, it's for me a little bit unusual. Um, Okay, well, um, so, okay, well, we, well, about the definition, okay. Um, okay, Debris is defined as an artificial object in Earth orbit, which does not serve uh, a useful function. I think it's quite clear, and the amount of space debris is rising, uh, and there are different objects, small one, very small one, micro objects, and very big one. Um, too, and um, they are flying through different areas of space as well. Um, but to understand the situation quite properly, we have to look a little bit closer to the facts. And um, yeah, here we, we see the um, um, NASA Orbital Debris Program Office. And um, now we get to the next slide. Yeah, um, and are prepared probably, hopefully you can see this. Um, this is a wonderful, wonderful graphic um, computer generated from NASA, and I copied it in this presentation because it makes you clearly um, give you an impression on the amount of um, Earth orbit or, or the uh, amount of satellites or uh, parts of satellites and uh, non-functional satellites pieces which are surrounding the Earth very closely, and some of them in a larger um, environment, more. Um, in the outer space. And so you can follow this a little bit more closely and give, it gives you a good impression, I think. Yeah. So a lot of traffic out there, right? <laughs> Some rules could be helpful, I guess. Some rules could be helpful. Yeah. yeah. Um, this image provides really a good visual, visualization um, of the greatest orbital debris population exists really very close to the, to the Earth. And um, well, here's some numbers which I found also very impressive. You can see here 130 million space debris objects from greater than one millimeter to one centimeter. And, uh, and even one centimeter to 10 centimeters, about one million. And when you think about this, the speed they can get in the outer space about 20, um, 20,000 miles uh, per um, second, I think a second or hour, I don't know exactly, but very fast, very fast. They can, they can um, create really uh, severe damages to satellites, even to the um, other space missions. And the uh, amount of uh, weight is more than 9,000 tons uh, flying, around, flying around the Earth. And you see the number of rocket launches in the start of space age in the 50s, about 6,200 and satellite um, rocks, uh, rocket launches have placed 12,000, about 13,000. So it's quite impressive, I think, um, uh, to, to read something about the um, numbers which are, were collected by, from the European Space Agency. So the first question is, do we have a legal definition of space debris? No, we don't have it. So no, there's no legal um, definition. And, um, but there are all more general descriptions of what it is. Well, this is, could be a start in a legal sense. And examples from space debris, it's a derelict spacecraft, upper stages of launched vehicles, by hikers, tiny objects, all like tiny flecks of paint released by thermal stress. And, um, the principal um, source of large orbital debris is satellite explosions and collisions. And um, the principal source of debris was from um, explosions of launch by hikers prior to 2007. And um, now in um, the more, in the 2000 years, um, we um, can observe that the uh, collision between communication satellites like Iridium-33 and one retired Russian spacecraft creates really a large debris in orbit and now represent, and this is very amazing, one third of all cataloged orbital debris. So, so that, I think it's really um, gives you an idea on how um, things are going on there. And even the satellite collision creates more and more and more. I will come a little bit more later to this. Um, called Kessler syndrome um, situation. 
And so we could ask the question, is there any international treaty on orbital debris which could uh, yeah, make it more comfortable for the people on Earth and even for the owners and proprietarian of satellites? Because it's a lot of money in the outer space flying around and uh, everybody would be, I think, uh, happy when there is no destruction of satellites. Um, but we have to um, perceive that there is no um, international treaty on orbital debris yeah, so far. Um, there are space agencies, they are working together, they are coordinating each other, and they have guidelines put in place which are not legally binding, but they are a first step into a coordinated management system. Let's call it this way. And the UN is also doing, um, is working on, on mitigation guidelines, for instance. So this is quite... I think we start here. You can see some of those um, yeah, impacts of very tiny uh, pieces. Uh, I've took this from a photograph, photo gallery from the NASA, but I think it's very impressive here. An impact of a completely um, an impact completely penetrate the antenna dish. You'll see this, and um, so it's yeah. And here you see a micrometeorite left this crater on the surface of a shuttle. <clears throat> and here's some larger objects, re-entry on Earth um, at here three 30 kilogram titanium pressure and tank arrived on Earth. And here another one, another piece flying uh, in the um, uh, on Saudi Arabia. Well, it's uh, sometimes also those objects are going down. And there are um, there's another um, case. I come later to this case where a nuclear piece of nuclear reactor, reactor goes went down on Canada in the 80s. And this caused some troubles between and discussion between Canada and Russia. And here you see the um, very most, most often quoted uh, collision of um, Iridium 33, a satellite from the US and Cosmos um, uh, 2251. And uh, they crashed together on um, above Siberia, about nearly approximately 800 kilometers. And um, this was witnessed as the first time of a hypervelocity collision um, of two satellites. And this makes the <coughs> sorry <clears throat> um, the uh, Kessler syndrome so very um, or, or underlined it, the um, effects and impact of this syndrome. And this will um, is, um, comes up from NASA scientist Donald G. Kessler, who um, um, described a scenario in which the density of objects in low Earth orbit due to space pollution is high enough that collision between objects could cause a cascade in which each collision can generate space drivers that increase more and more um, and um, will create or could create further collisions. And um, this, well, when the density of space, um, or when the density of satellite pieces um, is increasing, I think this it's a reaction everybody can um, very easily um, foresee. Yeah? And, um, and this here is uh, one big, um, yeah, well, one big collision was, which was witnessed. And um, this creates, I think, a um, lot of um, tension or probably, uh, or um, yeah, well, let's say a question may arise when uh, Starlink or SpaceX uh, or other private entities come have the idea to launch satellites or to launch rockets uh, yeah, to, um, serve, to, to offer services for other, um, for others, for governmental, governmental entities or even also in, um, yeah, in an economic sense. And here you see the countries with the most satellites in space. I take it from statistics and a statistic uh, service. And it's clear that the US, then China, and multinational, and then Russia, yeah, United Kingdom, Japan, India, and Canada are the most, um, well, uh, those states uh, doing, I think, or launching the most um, satellites in space. Yeah, quite interesting. And um, yeah, well, space law sources. Uh, where do we get them from? Um, first of all, from international law. Space law is unique, um, in a unique sense, international. 
and um, the UN serves there as a central um, organ with some uh, specific um, agencies uh, or committees. Committees. The first, um, the most um, uh, important committee is the Committee on Peaceful Uses for Outer Space, which was founded in 1959. As you see, it's the start of uh, the space, uh, the race to space. It's it's um, at least um, well reflecting the. Um, reflecting the tensions between the East and the West at that time. And then we, we, they have two very important subcommittees, it's the scientific technical subcommittee and the legal subcommittee, which is tasked to think about um, the new legal models of many questions um, linked with space uh, use or um, outer space. Yeah, but um, so far, um, well, we will come uh, then to a later point to those uh, questions and uh, back again. So we uh, here the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, UNUSA, assists um, as well any UN member states to establish legal and regulatory frameworks in line with the international um, basics or with the international treaties, which has been accepted so far. And then we see a lot of a bulk of soft soft law. This may be guidelines, this may be international and regional strategies, this may be at least um, some UN resolution coming from the General uh, Assembly. And um, well, they are not legally binding, but they sometimes serve as a quite, you know, um, as some give ideas or are the basic for coordinating um, together on an international level, some uh, aspects regarding or um, yeah, dealing with space law. Well, <coughs> sorry. Um, here, um, this is a very good um, booklet. Uh, everybody can download this. It's uh, free for use, um, made, um, uh, put together from the um, from the UN, from the um, uh, United Nations Office for Outer Space Affair. And um, this one treaty is on principles on governing the activities of states in the exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. Long name, short name is Outer Space Treaty. I think this is what you have to keep in mind. OST, Outer Space Treaty. I will never uh, again say this complete title at its complete uh, length. So, and uh, Simona Tadi Pippo, um, who is the director of the, this office, um, stated that this um, treaty here, Outer Space Treaty, represent a milestone in space history. Um, and other people um, are, are um, praising it as a constitution, at least, of um, space law. And this small booklet um, uh, yeah, um, uh, comprises the United Nations treaties. Uh, there are five, five uh, important United Nations treaties and five principles adopted by General uh, Assembly uh, are yeah, at least um, intertwined with those treaties. And then we have the related resolutions also adopted by the General Assembly and other documents like the Space Devils Mitigation Guidelines, which serve as a basis, um, but is yeah, uh, also developed in, in modern, uh, into modernity at least, um, but is at least here also printed and um, contained in this um, booklet. <clears throat> well, once again, here are the cornerstones of space law for uh, five treaties with the outer space treaties, and then uh, another four. And um, we also, uh, we, I think the rescue agreement and the re registration convention and the moon agreement are not um, at this, um, at that for our question in, in the focus. Uh, and the focus is um, here for us now today, the Outer Space Treaty and the Liability Convention. When we're talking about space debris, um, why not the Moon Agreement? The Moon Agreement, well, we, we probably will have a short look upon it, but it's only, um, so there are only, they have only 11 parties. This Moon Agreement uh, will work uh, with 11 states, only 11 states. And this is, well, very, um, a very, yeah, well, um, tiny, tiny number of, of um, states who were, uh, um, working uh, with this moon agreement. The United States is not a party of this moon agreement, and consequently, this moon agreement 
will not have any legally binding effect to the United States, also only as a reminder. The principles embodied in the uh, Outer Space Treaty, which um, has some relevance for space terrorists, is first of all, freedom of exploration and the use of space for the benefit for all countries. Well, this is quite important. It's not only for the benefit of one country or two countries, it's for, the all com for all countries. And the next um, yeah, great um, or more very important principle is, um, is um, dealing with the non-appropriation of outer space. So no state, <clears throat> no other governmental entity or uh, even non-governmental entity is entitled to um, own yeah, a, a piece of the moon or a piece of other celestial bodies. So this is um, prohibited and also is the pro um, prohibited the uh, deployment of nuclear weapons and kinds of weapons of mass destruction. Well, this is a kind of reflecting the former times of the 60s a little bit. <coughs> okay, so well, I will change now. And here we see the UN uh, resolution 1721, which um, cemented at least the committee a role in preserving space for peaceful purposes and the international law. And is clearly coming out here that in 1961, the General Assembly adopted this um, resolution and um, um, believing, and they are stating as, as a preface, um, as a preamble, that they're believing with the exploration and the use of outer space should be only for the betterment of mankind and to benefit of states, irrespective of the stage of the economic scientific development. So it's, this is really a holistic view. It's not only linked with one state. It's not linked to the um, very strong or powerful state. It's, it should be the use which benefit all states. So in the first time, I think it was scientific endeavors which are linked with um, outer space. And the um, uh, General Assembly commends this to the states for the guidance, uh, the exploration and use for outer space should follow following principles. International law um, applies to outer space and celestial bodies. It's not a question for national law. It's, it's a question about international law. It's the international community who uh, should govern and should um, yeah, well, um, work on the basis of international law. And outer space and other celestial bodies are free for exploration and use by all states, but in conformity with international law. And they are not subject once again to national appropriation. So this will mean the, the um, appropriation cannot be uh, followed in a, in a mean of um, national interest. It's not, there shouldn't be no national interest, but we, we will see it later. There are national laws in place. They are set in forth and um, particularly from uh, Luxembourg, which is a very tiny state in, in, in the European Union and the United States. And there are other um, countries also set in forth laws um, uh, applying on outer space. So, and then the committee on space, uh, peaceful uses for outer space was at least tasked to uh, study and report on legal problems arising from space exploration. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, sorry, I have to drink a little bit water. So, as I'm um, a legal, um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a jurist, I'm, I'm a lawyer, and I'm a professor for law. So, well, law um, attracts me, so I can hinder it to uh, offer you some insight to, to text and offer laws of the specific law. Because the question is, which law applies in outer space? We do have to uh, have an idea um, about the wording, about the content, and what we do see here, and what we do not have. Yeah? And uh, I would see or explain it to you later that, uh, well, it's um, not so um, difficult to, to guess that there is no at least um, sufficient legal basis um, for uh, this specific problem. Uh, called uh, space terrors. Well, the exploration and use of outer space, as I am stated before, 
shall be carried out, well, this is the Article 1, for the benefit and the interest of all countries. So it's at least, um, well, this, it's at least uh, the same idea which uh, was um, at least um, um, what we could find in the General um, Assembly um, with the resolution. And um, the um, outer space um, exploration uh, is free and can be used by all states. This is right. And there's a free access to all areas of celestial bodies. So nobody should be um, entitled to claim uh, properties or rights or um, at least, yeah, well, um, could yeah, deny any free access. And freedom of scientific investigation is also guaranteed here um, in this um, Article 2. And um, once again, not subject national appropriation. And so no claim of sovereignty by means or of use or occupation is allowed or by any other means. So this is quite clear. And this is um, um, exclusive. So there's this, um, an, an exclusiveness that national appropriation is prohibited and uh, only the on the basis of international law um, uh, uh, or international law at least explains uh, the framework in which um, yeah, the use of yeah, at least outer space or celestial bodies or the moon or even asteroids uh, can be um, uh, worked out. And um, state parties here maintaining international peace and security and there's an Article 7, a clear principle, a clear, um, um, at least, well, uh, yeah, a clear message that, uh, that any uh, state party who uh, launches an object into outer space is um, uh, internationally liable for damage caused by um, um, such an object. So this will mean that state parties are obliged to pay compensation, not, for instance, um, private entity. It's really, um, it's linked, it's linked with the states, not with the private entity. And the Article 7 at least is, or is the basis for the um, liability agreement, which we will uh, see uh, later on. And then we do have, as I mentioned before, non-binding instruments. And um, the last <clears throat> one of the uh, European instruments, instruments, or no, first of all, we have the UN Space Debris Mitigation Guidelines. Um, and uh, here we, uh, in, in the European Space Agency has developed their own requirements for space debris mitigation. And then they were superseded by the International Standard Organization, um, who has also put in place um, uh, debris mitigation requirements. So, so there are different kind of guidelines with probably different contents, probably not, not in the center, but more in the surrounding. And, um, and the transfer of guidelines, guidelines um, are still waiting for actual, uh, for transfer into national regulations. And this process is still pending. Worldwide implementation is missing. So that's the case here. And that will mean at least that the mitigation and the sustainability aspects here um, will be um, at least put in place on yeah, at least um, the working uh, of those uh, technical committees um, who are um, developing those um, guidelines. Um, the European Union, the European Union um, proposed um, in 2008 a draft um, code on space activities. And um, with this draft, um, the European Union wants to um, develop um, yeah, well, a modernized, a modernized uh, view how to solve problems in outer space. But it was at least rejected um, because the EU is not, the, is not a party to the UN and um, it was at least an attempt. And this was at least transferred, this attempt was transferred to a draft international code of conduct for outer space activities. And uh, this um, uh, draft international code of conduct was, was also um, not um, successful. It was intended to be the subject of negotiations uh, in the United Nations in 2015. And the code 
and um, political and not a legally binding document um, was at least um, rejected. So there was um, at least, there were uh, at least um, efforts uh, and endeavors to, to find at least a basis for regulations, but um, at least it doesn't work. Here you see the current approach of the European Union um, under the European External Action Service, and they're trying to put up a space traffic management program, also non, uh, not on the basis of legal um, uh, or legal regulation, but on the basis of governance. It's, it's kind of informal setting. It's kind of informal working together and produce at least guidelines and, and um, other um, basic um, documents, which are at least uh, helpful, but not legally binding. And this uh, well, could uh, better the situation, but at least from a um, legal aspect, it's not really binding. And so the question is, how does space law apply? And um, the um, space, once again, is an area beyond national jurisdiction. So there is no national jurisdiction, which is quite clear, and it's comparable with the high seas, uh, also governed through international law and to international entities. And two of the UN space treaties, the um, Outer Space Treaty and the Liability Convention from 1972, established compensation regime that would apply in circumstances of damage caused by the space debris when space debris, for instance, fall down to the Earth, or as well when satellites collide in space. And um, this um, legal regime, um, which was put in place from the liability um, convention, provide compensation for damage caused in outer space. And, but the liability is based on fault, and you have to prove that there was a fault which uh, at least caused a collision in outer space or even as um, re-entry down to Earth. And it was not considered the question of risk posed by space debris. So when you look in the negotiations for the Liability Convention, the, um, there's nothing you can find about space debris. Nobody was thinking about it. Nobody probably had in mind or could imagine that space debris uh, increased in such a short time, short time pe uh, period of time. And as a result, the negotiators did not address several liability issues of extreme export importance related to um, damage caused by space debris. Um, this is uh, at least, um, the, yeah, and many other questions were at least even not touched. Um, so damage means direct damage under the, um, under the wording of the liability convention. It doesn't mean indirect damage. So, <clears throat> um, and um, uh, these damage question um, or is, um, yeah, regulate um, uh, or compensate only the direct damage, but not um, the indirect damage. And even proof of neg negligence, um, or a gross negligence isn't um, touched um, as well, um, even uh, also isn't uh, touched and um, in this uh, liability convention. So this legal regime imposed liability on launching states for damage caused by space objects. And, um, and it does mean um, the liability under um, international space law imposed on countries, not as I mentioned um, yeah, before, on um, privately owned or operated uh, at least um, entities. And the liability convention has only been previously invoked once, one time, and this is the um, case uh, behind this, is the Cosmos 954 um, case where um, uh, Canadian, where on Canada um, fall down um, a Russian satellite with, with a nuclear reactor. And um, the breakup for this satellite over Canadian territory created a clear damage to uh, persons and property and the environment. And Canada um, summed up this um, 
a compensation about 6 million and they uh, come together on 3 million at least. And this was um, a settlement of claim between Canada and the Union of Socialist Republics um, at this um, case. And it was clearly um, invoked the, or it was clearly um, um, put in place the Article 2 of the Convention that a launching state shall be absolutely liable to pay compensation for damage caused by its space object on the surface of the Earth. So this is the um, basic for the compensation claim. And so the um, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics have to um, at least accept this settlement of claim. And, um, but okay, was only willing to pay the half uh, of the price at least, but um, it was about, yeah, about, as I mentioned before, three, um, uh, 30 million. <clears throat> Um, how much law for outer space is there? So we touched the um, and looked upon the international law, but okay, approximately 20 national space law are in force in USA, um, United States, Russia, Great Britain, France, and many others too as well. Germany um, has no national space law um, set in force. It was intended to. It was um, uh, intended um, due to the coalition agreement in 2018, but uh, never succeed. Um, so, why we need a special uh, national space laws when it's all international? So we do need we do need it for legal certainty in licensing, supervisory uh, and liability requirements for private companies, and even also for investment security and security for cooperation and peaceful development. So I come to the end and to the conclusion: how to deal with space debris in a legal sense? Um, we see that. At least there's no legal definition on space debris. There's no binding treaty on space debris as well. There's no binding multilateral agreement. We have only non-legally binding guidelines are set and forth on a more technical um, basis. And the scope of the liability convention is limited, does not properly fit on problems created by space debris. And legal problems occur, in particular on fault and indirect damages in the applicable uh, applicable liability convention. So therefore, what do we need? A framework of international law applying on space debris um, yeah, is still missing, which will gain more weight whilst the number of space debris will increase by the Kessler syndrome. So the question at least is who today is responsible for space junk? Who is responsible? Who take care? Who will clean up the mess? Well, this is uh, the question. And um, so what we can say today is, well, when there is damage, okay, there's a way to get compensated between states, but that's all. So there's no liability <clears throat> for cleaning up the mess. So this is the end of the story so far for me. And um, well, thank you um, for the first part for listening. Um, I will check uh, the time. Um, well, so space mining, I will um, speed up a little bit. Um, space mining <clears throat> in recent year, you can perceive growing interest on natural resources which could be extracted from asteroids and as well from the moon <clears throat> or even other celestial bodies and, uh, and, uh, and asteroids. And space mining does mean the exploitation of celestial bodies to get rare earth metals such as lithium and cobalt and other minerals highly needed from the industry. And um, I found um, a passage of so um, well. Um, 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 well, a text on the BBC <clears throat> where it's been said that mining the moon will help humans travel further in space to places like the Mars, and the moon can become an intergalactic petrol station because it has the resources needed for rocket fuel like hydrogen and oxygen. I think this is quite interesting too um, to have a station uh, outside on the moon and to um, then to. Um, start missions to asteroids or to the, even to the Mars. Um, well, the, here you see some um, well precious uh, metals or minerals um, with um, platinum or iron or cobalt, um, yeah, really, um, which are heavily needed. And to meet the demand for raw material for future decades, um, digitization, for instance, or other questions, um, uh, even for the clean energy transition, 
um, there's a great demand on certain minerals. And so far, um, the um, yeah, the occurrence of such minerals are um, yeah, well, really quite uneven. Um, and currently, the question regarding the condition to be established for the extraction of resources in outer space are um, on, on the way. I will touch them uh, very soon. But here as well, so far, no international legal framework is in force. Yeah. The basic document for the understanding and the application on space mining is as well the Outer Space Treaty. And this treaty looks back at the initial time of scientific endeavors in space and the conflict, conflict between the East and the West during the Cold War. So legal questions, who owes asteroids mining rights? We see the run on raw materials and the unequal distribution in the world with a view to digitalization shine a light on the relation between US, China, and Russia. Current legal situation in international law, is it adequate? Is it insufficient? Probably, yeah, the, last, the latter will uh, be more uh, closer to the reality. We have to deal with the Outer Space Treaty once again from the 70s. And we could, um, and we see the emergence of national laws um, in, for instance, in, in the United States. And the views of the U United Nations and others um, are not, um, well, there are different kind of views and it's quite uneven, even the view. So I think there's a big need for international cooperation to build a new framework um, dealing with mining rights and even de uh, dealing with um, space debris. So my short outline will here, once again, international law, out space treaty, national law and conclusion. Um, I don't want to um, okay, um, uh, recapitulate, recapitulate the uh, treaty on principle um, here of outer sp uh, the prince of the outer state um, outer space treaty, but um, um, once again, um, no national appropriation, no claim of sovereignty, use or occupation is uh, at least um, uh, excluded, um, but it's. Um, the international responsibility is well underlined and uh, even activities can be carried out by non-governmental entities as well as for governmental agencies um, as well too. So, <clears throat> so um, the economic um, perspective is clearly, to, uh, is clearly there and um, peaceful exploration is also uh, as well clear and I will skip a little bit further on. So we see here the responsible um, UN entity has discussed on potential legal models for activities in exploration, exploitation, and utilization of space resources in the last years. And uh, as you see here, this is the uh, latest um, report. You see here the number um, 13, general exchange of views on potential legal models, which is comes up every year. You can uh, observe this every year, and there are a lot of legal different views on the same topic. And this is quite interesting. So I will show you one diff or some different kind of views, legal views on the same topic, and you will see immediately that there is no consensus on the question. There is no consensus. There is no international consensus how to deal with those modern questions. And this is quite a little bit worrying. What Will, will the, the outcome is at least that a more and more state will enact and set in forth their own national legislation. And this would, could get some, create some trouble on the international level as well as uh, also probably could create tension between states when they're um, um, trying to exploit um, natural resources on the, yeah, on the basis of, of international law. As well, so then we have a collision between national law and international law could get a little bit problematic. So here, the principle of non-appropriation uh, was interpreted um, and when it comes to the application of natural resource of the moon, that only when such resources were in place, and um, there is um, prohibition, uh, it's prohibited, prohibited to um, um, set at least to try to get uh, appropriation yeah, um, on this 
materials when it's in place on the moon or other um, um, celestial bodies. And then when such resources were removed from their place, for instance, to down to earth, then no longer the national um, prohibition of appropriation is no longer applied. And the ownership then um, could um, then afterwards be exercised by states or private entities. So this is a different uh, differentiation, uh, which is, um, I think, well, logical in a certain uh, view, but also probably against the spirit, a little bit probably against the spirit of the outer space treaty. The other varieties you can see here um, that um, the legal views are um, concerned or concerning that the legal subcommittee should undertake detailed discussion about generally the exploitation and utilization of space resources by private entities. The legal status of celestial bodies, are, are they the same as the legal status of the resources on it? Can you differentiate between the legal status of resources? Are, are they probably, um, could they be exploited? and not interfering the legal status of the celestial bodies. Is this, is this possible? Um, is it possible that a private entity could exploit space resources or natural resources from asteroids for the benefit of all mankind? Or are even asteroids, are asteroids at least uh, comparable or the same like celestial bodies in the language of this outer space treaty? Nobody really can give you a complete answer. There is no uh, answer because the text and the wording is very vague. It's very open for extensive interpretation or restrictive interpretation. So it's not really uh, a helpful, at least, um, well, it is helpful, but many modern questions can't be, can't be uh, solved with this um, outer space treaty. So another one is here, you see the opposite. You see the opposite of a certain view which was expressed during the legal uh, committee about national legislation regarding the extra, uh, extraction or utilization of space resource, uh, resources by a private entity is in conformity with the state's international obligations. So this is a complete opposite. Yeah? You can see here states arguing under the, um, or in the um, uh, uh, specific agency um, tasked with the uh, question of um, developing legal uh, answers, that they um, are uh, have the the um, or interpreting interpreting the outer space um, a treaty that their neg national legislation can be uh, still uh, or can be put in place regarding resources taken from private entities. Only such legislation should include provisions. That the that are demonstrate there that the um, the absence of a will or intention uh, by a state to claim sovereignty yeah, over all part or of any celestial body, and um, this um, all those endeavors from private entities should be under the authorization and supervision regime of a state, and at least in the end, in the end. Um, we can see that the uh, opinions of legal ex experts differ widely. The differences arise from the ambiguity or lack of clarity on the legal position. And some states have en enacted their own laws that differ from the opinions that give precedence to international law. And uh, well, this creates tension. You see the Luxembourg Space Agency and the article one is space resources are capable of being owned. Well, interesting. And here we see um, the uh, US Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness, Competitiveness Act from 2015, signed from Barack Obama. And the law recognizes the right of US citizens to own space resources. And they obtain and encourages the commercial exploration and utilization of resources from asteroids. So now according to one article, United States citizens engage in commercial recovery of an asteroid resource or space resource under this chapter shall be entitled to any asteroid resource or space resource obtained, including to possess, own transport, use, and sell the asteroid resource or space resource obtained in accordance with applicable law, including the international obligations of the United States. 
So this means the interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty by the US government uh, is saying the international obligation, we are in line with this, we are interpreting this, but we put up at least the uh, entitlement for private entities to at least exploit and extract na uh, natural resources from asteroids or the moon or other, um, yeah, or um, at least, yeah, other celestial bodies. And then uh, the US President Donald Trump signed in 2020 an ex executive order on encouraging international support um, for um, outer space and for private, um, <clears throat> for private entities. We can see this here in, in the last um, section, um, successful long-term exploration and scientific discovery of moon, Mars, and other bodies will require partnership with commercial entities to recover and use resources, including water and certain minerals in outer space. Quite interesting. And this is the Artemis Accords. It's a non-binding legal, um, non-legally binding, um, at least um, basis for many space agencies to um, um, try to extract um, natural resources from um, in outer space and uh, which are in line with national appropriation under the Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty. So you can see at least the endeavor for trying to um, be in line with the international obligations. And on the other hand, at the same time, trying to put up national, um, at least yeah, to support national industry, national industry to go out on mission uh, on the moon, on the Mars, and um, at least um, uh, yeah, exploit uh, for uh, for exploiting the natural resources. So this um, brings me to my conclusion, and I'm um, um, yeah, and I, I've built an analogy for you. And think of a car built in the '60s, yeah, um, of the last century, and compared to one to one car made today. It's the same with law sometimes, and they bear their time and they reflect their thoughts of their time. And probably um, those thoughts reflected by the Outer Space Treaty are not well, um, and at least uh, in line with our questions we do um, raise up today. And international law, the second conclusion, needs to be revised and updated from my perspective to cover all issues related to space debris and the mining of natural resources on the moon celestial bodies and asteroids. And um, according to Article 2 of the Outer Space Treaty, um, once again, no, not a subject, they are not subject to national appropriation. And I think this is quite clear. We, we could have some problems to uh, understand asteroids as celestial bodies, but okay, this is at least once again, a question of interpretation. And it makes once again clear that this um, treaty is not so clear as, we, is, as it should be. And so there's a need for an updated strict regulation of asteroid mining, which should be concluded internationally from my perspective. And there's a significant need to come to an international solution under the auspices of the United Nations. Well, that's all. Here, some literature, if you like to read something more about this topic. And so thank you for your attention. And of course, I'm here for any questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Winry. That was absolutely excellent on such a difficult subject. And uh, one can really notice your law background, which was so essential to understand this. I, I actually, and all this excitement, forgot to launch some polls. So okay. I think the question <laughs> is now. <laughs> let's, let's quickly run the polls. Yeah, because, come on, do it. Um, Binfried actually came up with some questions that I wanted to yeah. launch for you. So let's just do this quickly. So this is about space mining. I'm going to launch this one. So let me read mm -hmm. it out. Do you think it is allowed to that you're allowed to start a mission to harvest an asteroid, exploit uh, precious metals, bring them back to Earth and sell them? You know, from what you've heard now, and it's quite <laughs> complex. What do you think? <laughs> well, it could be difficult. <laughs> yeah, it could. Yeah, but let's assume you could do all that. Is it yeah. actually allowed? Do you think are you, are you allowed to do that? Yes. Yeah, when you're living in the United States, when you're a citizen of the United States, you can do this. And even if you're a citizen in Luxembourg, you can do this too. You have to well, be in line and comply and in compliance with all the national legislation, but as long as you're in line with them and you have probably the support from NASA and other entities, 
I think there's no question about it. And I think many of those um, um, heavy invested entrepreneurs, the star entrepreneurs of um, the United States, like Elon Musk and many others, are working on this question. Right. And, and you could see how split the view was here, how difficult this topic is. You clearly say yes. <laughs> I'm saying it depends, right? <laughs> That's a typical lawyer answer, it depends. <laughs> yeah, it depends. It depends on the on the country where you live. Yeah, so it depends on the country, yes. Right, yes. exactly. And let's try the other uh, poll too. Yeah, now. sure. So that was, that's a good one. Let's try this one. So the next one is about space junk. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. If you make mess in, in, in uh, near Earth space, so we're not talking about some crazy um, um, enterprise stuff here. Do I have to clean it up? Do you have to clean it up? Yes, of course. There's legislation for it. Not at all. You can just say, well, it's not my problem. Or it depends mm -hmm. how lush the debris and garbage is. Uh, don't just wait a minute, a minute before you want to comment on it. Let, let people just do it. And then you are very free to comment. I just want to see what the outcome is before. Okay. Uh, because it's a difficult question, too. That's not, not, none of this. I mean, let's say you had the means as a private person or, yeah to do this yeah you you would come up uh, with with a solution you can do that and um you make mess what happens then right what happens this is interesting this is interesting okay i will go i'm going to wait uh, a few more seconds and then i'll share that and then put please then comment on this okay i'm going to end the poll now and share it with you it's very split views Yes, of course, it is my legal obligation. Is interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <clears throat> not at all. So, and so, what? What is the answer here? Well, not at all, because not yeah, at all. <laughs> yeah, cleaning up the mess would be um, well. This could be a really global, um, well, global requirement. It's, it's a global challenge. Um, but if if there would have been a legal obligation, then probably states would have already cleaned up the mess, but it's the only uh, obligation is uh, to pay compensation if something happens. If there's a direct damage right. or fault, then you get compensated probably yeah, um, in certain cases, in certain circumstances, but there's not right. a legal obligation to clean up the mess. So this, would be, this would be something, this would be really sustainable. Yeah, I think this would be really sustainable. 